In today's lessons, you're going to look at the central poetic images of blackberry picking. You'll explore the language in detail and study how precise meaning is crafted through literary technique. I want you to notice how semantic fields are created to create contrast and shift the focus of the story, particularly between the positive and the negative. I want you to reflect on the use of verbs to structure the time and sequence the use of a memory to tell the narrative of the poem. And then I want you to deconstruct and understand the nature of the whole of the narrative recounting. As you go, explore how Heaney uses memory of time and place to craft the poem. And ultimately, look at the use of the poetic voice to create the viewpoint of the poem. Before we start, I'd like you to just think about some of your own memories from childhood and how they impact you, even today. Don't worry if you don't want to share any memories, you can keep them to yourself. Did you ever go foraging for fruit as a child? What memories do you have of that? Was it a good experience? Was it fun? How does it make you feel now when you think back on it? I'd like you to reflect for a few moments on how our attitudes to the past change as we mature. Look at this picture of blackberries for a second. Think about how you feel about those. You might not particularly like them, but if you do, how do they make you feel at this moment? How would you describe those? Now look at these images. Each one might evoke particular feelings or emotions. Reflect on those for a few seconds. Now in your book, I want you to list as many positive modifiers as you can to describe this fruit. So use lots of adjectives if you can. And if you are doing something with the fruit, eating it, cooking it, preparing it, think about adverbs that you might use to describe how you process or deal with the fruit. Now look at these images. Which words would you use to describe these? Find a clean copy of the poem. And then with two different highlighters, I'd like you to highlight positive words in one color and any negative words in another color. Think about the connotations of those words and what makes them positive or negative. And if you can't decide, if you think something's neutral, uh, you could underline it. Have a look at my answers. There's not a right or wrong answer here, but I do want you to look at the way in which certain words elicit positive feelings and others evoke more negative feelings. Blackberry picking for Philip Hobsbawm. Late August, given heavy rain and sun for a full week, the blackberries would ripen. At first, just one, a glossy purple clot, among others red, green, hard as a nut. You ate that first one, and its flesh was sweet like thickened wine. Summer's blood was in it, leaving stains upon the tongue and lust for picking. Then red ones inked up, and that hunger sent us out with milk cans, pea tins, jam pots, where briar scratched and wet grass bleached our boots. Round hay fields, corn fields and potato drills, we trekked and picked until the cans were full, until the tinkling bottom had been covered with green ones, and on top big dark blobs burned like a plate of eyes. Our hands were peppered with thorn pricks, our palms sticky as bluebeards. We hoarded the fresh berries in the byre, but when the bath was filled, we found a fur, a rat-grey fungus, glutting on our cash. The juice was stinking too. Once off the bush, the fruit fermented, the sweet flesh would turn sour. 
I always felt like crying. It wasn't fair that all the lovely canfuls smelt of rot. Each year I hoped they'd keep, knew they would not. If you think about the poem itself, think about which words or ideas we might relate to a childhood, childhood view of the world and which might be more of an adult perspective. See if you can just list words and categorise them in those two different areas. In the poem, Heaney explores the childhood perspective. It is one of innocence, joy, play and fondness. He delights in nature here. He recalls the innocent games of childhood, imaginative play with red-coloured hands and juice playfully reminding us of the notorious bluebeard. The children hoard and indulge in the fruit and they stash it away in a cache like pirates on an adventure. However, the joy of this is soured by the decay and knowledge of death which rots the fruit. In contrast, the adult perspective is based on a knowing and experienced world. The words of flesh, blood, lust and bluebeard's sticky palms are more sinister when we know that he is a serial killer who murdered his wives. All the fruit that once innocently hoarded is spoilt by the fermentation of experience. The knowledge of that is also a negative. The injustice of the world recalls the fallen nature of creation where we have to live in futile hope for innocence, knowing that all is actually death and decay. If you look at the first section of the poem, there are a number of things that we can look at in terms of the language. Those highlighted in green are adverbials. Late August, for a full week, at first, among others, then, these words help structure the narrative in the past. They create the timeline and they send us to the back, to the moment in time with those temporal markers like late August and for a full week. Other words like where um, create a relative reference to a particular place in that moment, to that place where the briars scratched. Look also at the verbs in red. Given heavy rain, the blackberries would ripen. You ate, the red ones inked up, and the hunger sent us, and the grass bleached. All these past tense forms construct the narrative in the past, but more than that, they create situations in that past. So you've got the conditional would ripen for the generic statement that this was a regular occurrence for a full week the blackberries would ripen it wasn't just one moment in the past it happened regularly in the past each year late august notice how it's given heaven heavy rain that rain and sun speaks of a childhood experience he knows the best times for the blackberries to be growing and then when we get on to eight Notice the subject, you ate. The second person pronoun you is acting like an indefinite pronoun. It's not I ate or one ate, it's you ate. A very colloquial reference to what all the children did this time. Similarly, it's a plural pronoun in us later on in the yellow. Then red ones inked up and that hunger sent us out with milk cans. The children of that time all shared this experience. Have a look then at the modifiers. They're in a slightly brownish colour. Heavy, red, green, sweet, red, wet. They're quite positive. They construct a very sensual, visual picture of what it's like. It's fresh, it's alive. And last of all, look at those in blue. The imagery, the glossy purple clot hard as a knot, like thickened wine, summer's blood, lust, inked up, briars scratched. These images are more 
powerful. They're the poetic images and the force of the poem, and they tend to be more negative. If you look at the similar language patterns on this slide, you have the adverbials round, until, until, and with, and on top. These act like prepositions round the hayfields, until that moment, until that moment, and with green ones, and on top. All of these things are layered through those markers. Similarly, the pronouns we, our, and our. Heaney is adopting the voice of the children. He's explaining their experience. He speaks for the group of children, all of that generation who lived like this. Then look at the verbs, trekked, picked, the cans were full, had been covered, they were peppered. You've got your basic past tense forms, we trekked and picked to recount the narrative in the past. But then to go back, you've got those blue perfect, the past perfect, it had been covered, they were peppered. All of those things were happening then. And then look at the imagery here. The blobs burned. A plate of eyes. As sticky as blue beards. The imagery is violent. You have a plate of eyes. Disgusting. But also childish as well. And palms as sticky as blue beards. The innocence, but at the same time, the adult knowledge of who Bluebeer was. And the visceral image of a plate of eyes is really quite disgusting. Bluebeard is a popular French folk tale. It was retold by Charles Perrault in the 17th century and has been passed on for, for decades, centuries. In the story, Bluebeard is a rich, powerful nobleman who has a number of wives who mysteriously go missing. Having lost his wives mysteriously, Bluebeard marries the youngest daughter of his neighbour. He then has to go out of town and leaves her with the keys to the chateau and forbids her to explore the dungeon. She decides to have a party with her sister and friends. In the party, she does explore the dungeon and discovers the dead bodies of the former wives, and in her fear she drops the key in the blood. It won't wash off, and when Bluebeard returns, he is incensed and threatens to kill her. She then begs for mercy, and wants to pray with her sister. And while this is happening, her brothers arrive and kill Bluebeard. The women then gain all the money and marry the men that they want. This stanza is worth looking at on its own because this is where the poem turns. We hoarded the fresh berries in the byre, but when the bath was filled, we found a fur, a rat grey fungus glutting on our cash. The juice was stinking too. Once off the bush, the fruit fermented and sweet flesh would turn sour. I always felt like crying. It wasn't fair that all the lovely canfuls smelt of rot. Each year I hoped they'd keep, knew they would not. The change in mood is dramatic. We have that childhood innocence, but we have the realisation of the adult who knows that things will decay. The sweet flesh would turn sour. There's an echo there, not only of the sweet flesh of fruit, but the sweet flesh of life and the decay for all flesh. He always feels like crying. Perhaps there's a sense of grieving for the growing sense of mortality. And it isn't fair, the injustices of death in life. And there's that brutal reality at the end. Each year I hoped they'd keep, knew they would not. The childhood who wants there to be no death and no decay, and the adult who is experienced and know that that cannot be. And in this last section, if we look closely at the language, 
Let's look at the verbs first. We hoarded, the bath was filled, we found a fur. A rat grey fungus is glutting on our cash. The juice was stinking, the fruit fermented, the flesh would turn sour. I always felt like crying, it wasn't fair. The can smelt, hoped they would keep, knew they would not. A lot of these words are quite brutal. Hoarded, filled, found, glutting, stinking, fermented. Look at the plosives, look at the harshness of them, and the long list of verb after verb coming to the final reality. Hope they would keep, knew they would not. Harsh letters, harsh endings. Look again at the pronouns. We did this, we found it, it was our cash. But by the end, it's become personal. The first person pronoun, I always felt like crying. I hoped they would keep. And so from that common experience as a child, Heaney shifts to the personal experience, which is still the personal voice in his poem at the end. I always felt like crying, and there's a sense that he still does. It's still unfair. Look at the imagery in the blue highlighted. Hoarded, rat grey fungus, glutting, cash, like crying. You have negatives there. The hoarding of the fruit, the fungus that grows in the disgusting rat greyness of it, the glutting which is overindulgent, and the cash a secret hidden away thing as if there's something shameful or wrong about it. And then there's the grief of like crying. Contrast that with the very few positive modifiers here from the fresh berries, the sweet flesh and the lovely canfuls, which have gone washed away by this long line of negative words. The poem is dedicated to Philip Hobsbawm, one of the Belfast group. He'd had a successful poetry group in London, and as he moved to Queens, he'd set up a similar group in Belfast. The poets met, shared ideas, and encouraged each other to promote poetry. If you look at some of the phonetic structure of this verse, you, you don't get such a strong sense of rhyme. There are some half rhymes in sun, ripen, clot, not, sweet, in it, for, hunger, pots, boots. So those half rhymes create a, a clear structure but it's the rhythm of the poem that is most important. And that is reinforced through the regular use of um, assonance and the plosives. Late August, given heavy rain and sun. Look at that pattern of um, couplets on the first line. For a full week, the blackberries would ripen. At first, just one, a glossy clot. Ah, oh, 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 and among others, red, green, hard as a knot. Those plosives, d, d, t, punctuate the line and create the steady rhythm. You ate that first, and its flesh was sweet. Ah, ah, e, e, ah, e. Notice how quite often Heaney has a succession of short vowels. And then he slows things down in a more contemplative way with the longer vowels, sweet, like thickened wine. Summer's blood was in it, leaving stains upon the tongue and a lust for picking. Then red ones inked up and that hunger sent us out with milk cans, pea tins, jam pots, where briars scratched and wet grass bleached our boots. Look at that last line, grass bleached our boots, 
There's a fondness in that slow recollection of the past and the memory. In this stanza too, you have a mixture of long vowels and short vowels punctuated with a lot of plosives, each one recalling the sound as these blackberries are dropped into the bin. Round hay fields, corn fields and potato drills we trekked and picked until the cans were full. Until the tinkling bottom had been covered with green ones and on top big dark blobs burned like the plate of eyes. Our hands were peppered with thorn pricks, our palms sticky as blue beards. Interestingly, from the childish point of view, the longer vowels on plate of eyes and blue beards innocently, innocently gloss over what those things are. In the middle of it, we've got the onomatopoeic tinkling. The tinkling bottom had been covered on top of big dark blobs. Those blackberries drop in, creating and punctuating the actions. But the whole thing is memory and covered with the vowels, the longer vowels, creating a much slower, measured, fond recollection. And in the last section, we hoarded the fresh berries in the buyer. Those shorter vowels are bracketed by the longer vowels of hoarding and the buyer. But when the bath was filled, we found a fur. It slows it down, the growing realization a rat grey fungus glutting on our cash. Again, short punctuations destroying what's there. The juice was stinking too. Once off the bush, the fruit fermented. The sweet flesh would turn sour. There's that adult slowness, the recollection of the past. I always felt like crying. A slow realization that recollection, it wasn't fair. That all the lovely canfuls smelt of rot, rattles off there, and then the realization each year I hoped they'd keep, knew they would not. And that last final negative short vowel and the harsh plosive of the negative not destroys that hope. And there is the poem. A realization from an adult perspective that innocent joy and hope is futile.